Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Kwong, uh, and I hope you've been enjoying uh, today's uh, fantastic uh, array of, of perspectives and guests uh, on this uh, theme of race and, and science fiction. Before I get started, I do want to give one more shout out to the poster, which was uh, designed by Xavier uh, Guerrero, uh, who, um, you know, contributed his fantastic uh, aesthetic eye uh, to this kind of portrait of, of liberation. Um, <clears throat> so thank you all for coming to Piper session three, which is on pulps and golden age sci-fi. Um, uh, we'll begin with my introducing each speaker and giving them time to present their research in turn. Each speaker will have about 15 minutes uh, to speak as one of our speakers had to drop out at the, at the last minute. Um, so during the session, just for those of you who are joining us uh, just now, chat and Q&A may be used at any time, but the, uh, the panelists and moderators, or myself, uh, won't begin responding until the discussion time at the end of their uh, presentations. So you can chat with everybody by just clicking chat at the bottom of the screen. You can pose observations and questions to observers or to the speakers by clicking on Q&A uh, also at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and y'all can see one another's questions and upvote questions that you like or that you would also like to ask, uh, which will then mo move those questions to the top of the queue. Um, and then after all the speakers are presented, I'll just open the floor um, for reading those uh, Q&A uh, questions. All right, so first up is um, Christopher Leslie. Oh, and you can read their full bios uh, in the program. Uh, Christopher Leslie has taught at Hunter College, John Jay College, New York University, Universita Potsdam, and the South China University of Technology. His talk is entitled, The Menace of Mars, Resistance to White Male Privilege in the Golden Age. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for the organization. Uh, really happy to be here uh, today. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in thinking about the ways in which golden age science fiction authors can offer us evidence uh, about the new thinking about human races uh, at the beginning of the 20th uh, century. And as you may know, um, the, the, the notion of race sort of solidified in the 19th century in the, in the United States with the school of anthropology known as the American school, sort of suggesting that there's going to be a small number of distinct racial groups, each with their own aptitudes and possibilities for the future. Um, it certainly is not the first time that somebody enunciated this. Um, Linnaeus in the 18th century had already sort of proposed this, but in the, in the 19th century, in the context of uh, race-based slavery, um, this uh, idea really took hold. Uh, and with these sort of um, 19th century statements, there was even an idea that each human race was a, a separate species. Um, and the situation um, became um, sort of hidden from ideas of race, uh, specifically through this idea of the stages of civilization. And uh, Lewis Morgan is probably the most famous person who promoted this idea, but the idea that each group of humanity, although maybe we're all, we were all one human race, had gone through a different um, stage or had reached a different stage through effort and through history, uh, became something that um, was used to um, uh, rationalize uh, racial um, prejudice. And at this time, there's not a really great concept of culture um, until it's not something that we get until um, Franz Boas in the, in the 20th century. And so the idea that like each human species had its own particular expertise, uh, making civilization or making war, um, bees make beehives, um, beavers make dams, the sort of idea that inside your biology was this uh, expression of culture um, became uh, quite profound. And if you look at some of the uh, authors from the, uh, this time period, like this um, guy, uh, W.J. McGee from the, right at the turn of the century, uh, the idea that humanity, human, human groups all sort of progressed uh, differently um, became the way in which 
people rationalized rules of, against uh, racial mixing uh, and also su supported um, sort of the new um, uh, idea of Jim Crow uh, in the wake of uh, the end of Reconstruction. And you can see, and if you read Mickey's papers, you can see this idea that everything from the way in which innovation is carried out to the way in which social bonds are organized was thought to be um, the way in which we could represent uh, humanity on these various stages of um, civilization. And if you take a look at the beginning of the 20th century, this is the time when people start to challenge um, this scientific racism. Uh, with, especially at the, it was especially difficult at the beginning because they don't, we didn't have this concept of culture and the sense that human skills and human ideas are learned and passed from one person to the other as, as opposed to being uh, innate. Um, but Elazar Barkin in this book, The Retreat of Scientific Racism uh, said that at the beginning of the century, the inferiority of certain races was no more to be contested than the law of gravity to be regarded as immoral. Uh, and so it was a, very common to think about a person's aptitudes and abilities were coming from their biology and something that um, is beginning to be challenged at the beginning of the 20th century, but really not until 1950 do we have um, sort of a strong statement against it. And why I find this interesting is because this is the period when science fiction in the United States is really starting to take off. Right? Hugo Gernsback publishing in the beginning of the uh, 1900s or um, thinking about the ways in which we have um, a new um, humanity sort of grew up at the same time as science fiction. And by the time Gernsback coins the phrase science fiction uh, in 1929, uh, this debate is still, still going on. And so we can look at these authors maybe with a new lens uh, and it helps me to uh, understand uh, how some authors were trying to challenge uh, racialized notions and, and some did not. One of the interesting findings of this um, lens, I guess we can call it, is that there's a lot of racism that's lurking in, in early science fiction that is not really apparent. Um, you know, the, the sort of idea that there's two green races on the voyage of, of the Skylark in uh, Smith and Garby's Skylark of Space. I mean, you know, the one lighter race, the one darker race, it seems to be sort of a racialized uh, parable. But when we start to realize that the the, the subjugated race is actually the race that does uh, invents things. And the, um, the, 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 the reason why the humans think it's okay to intervene is because they're being suppressed by this um, war or barbaric uh, race. All of a sudden reminds us of Lewis Morgan and his ideas of the stages of civilization. And so this story that doesn't really seem to be about race really is uh, at its heart. Uh, about race. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more uh, explicit. Uh, Edward Keller was one of Gernsback's uh, favorite writers. And he, they, he <laughs> writes about how women try to change their biology by taking Chinese, uh, um, um, the, 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 the fluids of Chinese people and mix them into their, their biology so that they can be stronger. And, this all fails. And the reason why it fails, of course, is because you're not supposed to mix the races. And so that sometimes it's sort of overt the way in which this racial ideology comes into play. But in other stories that are very much loved, like Stanley Weinbaum's A Martian Odyssey, it doesn't really seem to be a racist uh, story until you find out that Tweel, the, the alien that's depicted here, um, is rescued because he has a tool belt and the other creatures on the planet aren't worth rescuing because they don't use tools. And so again, we have this sort of um, American School of Anthropology um, showing its face in, in the science fiction as people are trying to work out um, what they're going to do about scientific racism. And for me, I think the most interesting thing is to look at some authors that were are not always well regarded, uh, especially from 1950 till 1970, people like Claire Winger Harris, who was pretty famous for being um, the winner of the third place winner of Gernsback's um, science fiction contest. Uh, and we can talk about um, the fate of Poseidonia uh, later if you want, but I, I'd like to take a look at two of our other stories that maybe are not so well known. 
Uh, one of them is the menace uh, of Mars and this idea of the solar system being an atom uh, and the idea that the universe is in a changing state is what people usually remember the story for. Um, but what's happening in the story is that the planets are becoming closer. And so they can observe Venus and they say Venus used to have a civilization, but it was destroyed. And then they see Mars and they say, oh, there's nobody, there's nobody on Mars, there's no civilization. And the, and the, the scientist says, you're assuming that their civilization is like a human civilization. What, what if they have a different form of life? And it turns out that the whole planet is sort of this conglomerate um, consciousness that is, um, you know, manifests itself in this red dust. Mars attacks Earth, starts to take over. Supplied of water is the uh, thing that uh, prevents the Martian menace from taking over. Um, and I think it's, it's an interesting story. It sort of shows resistance to this white male privilege in, in, in an unusual way, right? I mean, usually we have these human-like aliens that are coming. the ecology of the planet, um, but also this idea about what is alive and what does it mean to have consciousness and um, how can we think about uh, different uh, beings that are not humanoid, right, uh, is an important part of this, the story's resistance. And, and finally, this idea that humans are always adapting and the ecology of the planet is, is disrupted, um, but there is no ideal place for humans to live, which was a, was, was a key part of the scientific racism. The other story from Harris that I like to read is um, the Ape Cycle, um, which is uh, sort of like the Planet of the, of the Apes. I'm not gonna at this time make a claim about the connection, but uh, there is a scientist family named Stoddard that breeds intelligent apes and they're put to use in running the world's uh, machines. So there's not a lot of physical labor in this future that Harris imagines, but there is still people who, who have to maintain the machines and they figure out a way to hasten apes along the evolution so they can run the machines and their desire to have more capable servants then leads to a rebellion as, as you can imagine. Um, and again, the story is not obvious in the way that it deals with um, uh, like a confrontation against science. But one of the key things is that the, the three generations of Stoddards are the family dynasty that runs science, the science and this is not the way in which science uh, should be done, uh, even in the 1930s. And so this challenge to the sort of um, uh, uh, feelings about science that maybe um, Harris um, encountered in her, in her professional life, I think is coming true there, that there is not a merit-based science, but a, 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 a patron's kind of science. The other connection, of course, is this guy Stoddard. Um, who wrote a 1923 book called The Rising Tide of Color Against the White World Supremacy. And he's the one that's mentored as Goddard and The Great Gatsby. And this has gotta be on her mind when she's thinking about these people who are trying to um, uh, make it easier for uh, white people uh, to live. Uh, and so you know, this is sort of interesting to think about these stories about evolution uh, with the backdrop of the scientific racism. The other person I'd like to talk to I'll talk about is L. Taylor Hansen. She is famous because she is uh, she masqueraded as a man for part of her career, uh, and so her stories um, don't necessarily seem overtly resistant to white male privilege. In fact, it, it might seem as if she was um, sort of trying to benefit from it. But when you read the stories carefully, they all of a sudden make fun of science and uh, think about reversing the idea of um, uh, scientific progress. Um, so the man from space, the men in this story are not serious. They're frat brothers who are going to college and they um, are not high-minded people uh, at all. And so they get to meet the, the alien, um, but they are not really capable of uh, being heroes. And so this story to me is a very interesting way in which the sort of non-serious male characters get into arguments about different theories, um, but are unable really uh, to utilize anything that they have learned. Uh, and uh, so here we see this, um, you know, the supposedly the white men were the ones that were more, most rational. And this is the time when people are starting to construct engineering as 
uh, activity that's done by rational uh, creatures and also to create genders so that men are the ones that have this rational nature. And so the sort of collaboration of those two theories comes together in this story. The other thing that's interesting about uh, Hansen is, is her interest in um, like ancient civilizations. And I think this is also, you can profitably take a look at this as a way of trying to resist the um, sort of natural, naturalized scientific racism of the time. Um, when Taylor goes back and reviews these, you know, these fictional societies, she shows that they were actually uh, scientifically advanced. Uh, and so this frame story begins with the two gentlemen adventurers arguing about relativity and Newtonian physics. Uh, it turns out that the guy who believes in relativity is also an ancient Egyptian who has been time traveling uh, through the generations. And he's able to do that because Egyptian science was so advanced that he came into contact with uh, a, a planet around a, um, a very massive star that has a different time experience of time. And his proof of uh, relativity is, is his extended lifespan because he keeps on popping back to the planet and then uh, coming back uh, 200 years later to monitor the progress of humanity. And so this, this idea that the past civilization was greatest and the human evolution isn't toward a perfection ideal is certainly a challenge to the scientific uh, racism. But also this dispute, right? The, the, the frame narrator's uh, resistance to this newfangled thing called relativity is, is humorous, right? The scientist, uh, this male scientist who can't wrap his head around um, uh, relativity is an interesting uh, kind of character. And so I, I think this is an interesting opportunity to, to look at you know, historically his science fiction because it shows the ways in which different authors were kind of grappling with and trying to understand this new science uh, that was going to replace the scientific racism of the 19th uh, century. What's unfortunate is that some of the well-known authors seem to support scientific racism in a way that was not obvious, although maybe we shouldn't be too surprised, right? Um, in the way in which uh, the sort of community of, 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 of scientists and engineers were also supportive of, of the racial science. But I think it's also easy to see the excellence of authors like Harris and Hansen through this lens uh, it's much easier to understand what kind of um, project they're engaged in. Uh, for many years, their uh, fiction was sort of ignored, um, but these days uh, we're starting to see more of them again. And the, the fight against racism was different, um, perhaps in some ways than in 1950 or before 1950 and, and the way in which they challenged uh, notions of homogenous races and the tie between race and biology, I think is an important one to, to remember. Um, but also, uh, I think that they have some lessons uh, for today. Some of the ideas uh, that they promote are ways that we can certainly think about re-engaging um, re, re with the fight against racism uh, and uh, thinking about the epistemologies that, that support uh, racist thinking. So I hope that wasn't too long. I can guess I finished on time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Leslie. That was fantastic. Um, and I'm looking Thanks. forward to hearing the, the, the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so next up, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Shaviro um, of w Wayne State University in Detroit. The longer version of this presentation is linked uh, in the chat. And uh, Professor Shaviro's talk is entitled Exercising Lovecraft. Hi. Thanks. Um, welcome to everybody and I've had a great time seeing the presentation so far. Let me see, let me get, figure out the share screen. Um, there's a whiteboard sitting, okay. That's what I want to share. Okay, is that working? I can't see, I can't see on my it's screen working. if it's working. Okay, it's, so you see the working. slide. Okay, yeah. so, um, I, my talk is too long, which is why I recorded it as a video, which you can watch later if you're interested. But I'm trying, I'll try to give a quick version of it here. Okay, so H.P. Lovecraft is one of the most important writers of what's now called weird fiction. He wrote in the 1920s and 1930s, wrote for pulp magazines, but he's been 
in, but he's been followed. I should probably stay back to this. But he's been followed for years. He's now maybe even more popular than ever. And he's obviously a very problematic writer because he has undeniable power and brilliance in this kind of weird, over-the-top pulp way. But he's also an extreme racist. And the question is, it's why, I mean, there are some things which you might say, this is just really bad. This is just awful. We should just reject it. But there are other things where you might say, if there's both good and bad here, how do we distinguish them? So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about Lovecraft and then talk about recent responses to Lovecraft, which is, seems to be a big thing now, especially with the TV show um, Lovecraft Country, which I believe this afternoon's keynote speech will be about. But this it's been happening in prose fiction before it made it to TV anyway. So I'll start very briefly with Dark Vesuvian, who's a theorist of science fiction, who is the one who introduced the term cognitive estrangement. Um, by which he meant that science fiction would be work which estranges us from our normal presuppositions and does this in a kind of cognitive way that we just have a deeper understanding. Suvin doesn't like Lovecraft or any kind of what is now called weird fiction because it isn't cognitive in his sense. It doesn't give us knowledge about what the ultimate nature of reality or whatever. Um, in fact, I, this seems to be unfair because Lovecraft is actually very much about the limits of cognition. Another theorist, Mark Fisher, the weird and the eerie, writes about Lovecraft as an exploration of what's alien to humanity, what's not, not only what's alien to us, like a different race of beings from a different planet, but in the sense of that which in reality is too strange for us to conceptualize, something which doesn't fit into our cognitive categories. And that is kind of the basis of what weird fiction is about. So it's, it's actually playing, a, I'd say, a very important role in modern thought and modern literature in terms of emphasizing that we don't know everything, we can't know everything, that we maybe need to question our own frameworks or basic underlying assumptions about what's real. And as another writer about Lovecraft, Harman, Joy Graham Harmon points out, Lovecraft does this not only with his plots, which are usually involving confrontations with un, un, non-understandable aliens, but also through the way he writes. It's very prose style describes things which we can't visualize. If, I mean, the problem with making Lovecraft into movies, so it's been tried every many times, is that Lovecraft is about entities which our visualization fails, our conceptual frameworks fail. We don't know how to talk about them. Okay, so here's a quote from one of Lovecraft's famous stories, The Call, Call of Cthulhu, which is sort of, it's the introduction to the story sort of introduces us to this whole thing. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. The scientists, the sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piercing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light of the, into the peace and safety of a new dark age. So the point is that Lovecraft isn't metaphysical or occult in, in traditional ways or religious or anything like that. He's actually a materialistic atheist, but he believes that science shows us that the world is not fit to our measure, that we have a precarious place, you know, that we can easily be wiped out, that there are all these cosmic forces which don't care about us one way or another. Not even which are his monsters, not even, don't, they don't hate humanity. They don't, they sort of don't notice humanity in the same way we we usually don't notice like microbes, which are part of our environment and part of our bodies, and therefore they're a threat to us. Um, and it's a compelling vision, but it also is where we get from metaphysics to politics, let's say, or from a metaphysical vision to Lovecraft's quite horrendous racism. So one of Lovecraft's more famous stories is called The Howard Red Hook. Lovecraft lived in Providence, Rhode Island for most of his life, but he came to New York for a couple of years and he was in Brooklyn and he hated it. Um, he just had his, his, his rhetoric in the story is over the top about what's horrifying to him about Brooklyn as the background for seeing monsters trying to enter the human realm is all this stuff about, you know, all the people there who aren't white Anglo-Saxons, they're people of different races. They're, you know, he just, I mean, it's, it's, it's really insane and kind of horrifying. I mean, you know, my own grandparents were immigrants to Jewish immigrants to Brooklyn in the 1920s. So they're among the people who Lovecraft was seeing with this loathing and hatred. And, you know, so the, the problem of this of Lovecraft is that you can't just dismiss him because there is a very compelling aspect to his 
writing, but at the same time, there's, there's all this kind of horrible, vile stuff goes on. So how to deal with it is, is the question. So, I mean, in one way, people, like, critics like me can write essays talking about what's wrong with Lovecraft. That's certainly a useful thing to do. But one thing that's happening in the last five or seven years, which is particularly interesting to me, is how writers of speculative fiction, of fantastic science fiction and fantastic fiction, have themselves been writing counter Lovecraft narratives. So they write books which both um, take what's valuable and powerful in Lovecraft, which is this frightening view of reality, but also do a kind of flip on it, turn it inside out in order to make it a critique of race, of, of Lovecraft, and specifically of his racism and also misogyny. So I have a list here of a number of books in recent years which have done that. One of them, Matt Ruff's novel, Lovecraft Country, became the HBO adaptation by Misha Green, which is, to my mind, it's the best TV show I've seen all year. And it really expands beyond the book and covers even more ground. And it's a great work. And I'm glad we'll be hearing about it later this afternoon. The, other, the, the others are also authors who take particular texts by Lovecraft and flip them inside out in order to take what's valuable from them, but also critique them and critique what's wrong with Lovecraft. I will talk particularly about the two first and the last one on the list, Victor Laval's Bow the Black Tom and N.K. Jemison's The City We Became. Okay, so The Ballad of Black Tom is a specific rewrite of Lovecraft's story, which I mentioned already, The Horror and Red Hook. It takes place in New York City in 1924. The main character, Tommy Tester, known as Black Tom, is a black man from Harlem who gets entangled, goes to Brooklyn and gets entangled with the story in Lovecraft's, with Lovecraft's story, and he meets the main characters in Lovecraft's in Lovecraft's story, who are basically Malone, a detective who's the good guy in Lovecraft, but who gets completely freaked out by the horrors he discovers, and the bad guy, Robert Soydam, who's this kind of aristocratic old money who tinkers with forces of evil and with non-white racial types and things like that and gets punished for it. But anyway, um, here we have a kind of novel which sort of takes everything in Lovecraft, all the supernatural stuff is real. There really are monsters from a dimension behind Earth. And it's really true that cosmic forces are totally indifferent to us. But what Laval does is he rewrites the story, follows all the events of the story, adds other events, and does it from the, from the point of view of this Black character who comes to realize, as the white characters in the original story do, that there's all this stuff going on in the world which is not about us and which about beings who don't even care about us and are totally indifferent to us and might destroy us just because they don't even notice. And this whole theme, which is big in Lovecraft, of cosmic indifference. And what Laval does is, as his character, Tommy, sort of think about cosmic indifference versus actual human hostility. So this quote I have in the middle here, a fear of cosmic indifference suddenly seemed comical or downright naive. What was indifference compared to malice? Indifference would be such a relief. I'll take Cthulhu over your devils any day. So Cthulhu is one of the monsters in Lovecraft stories. This happens when Tommy comes back home and finds that his father has been murdered by a, a, a cop who's gonna get away with it because he's a cop and he killed a black person. And he's, Tommy has come back, learned about this you know, cosmic indifference, which is beyond the human. And he says, well, people, these white people find this so terrifying, but they don't have to deal with the everyday reality, which is actually, for us, even more terrifying. OK, so what happens is he intervenes in the story. And in the, in the original Lovecraft story, this guy, Soydam, calls up this monster, but then dies because he can't control the monster. And the monster is ultimately banished back to the nether realms, at least for a while. And what, and, and Tommy, however, basically joins the side of the monster. He works for the monster and helps make the monster, help the monster take over. He's willing to say that reality for people of color is so bad that it's probably better to just destroy the world than it is to, um, that, than it is to leave things the way they are. And he talks about the indifference and how the monsters, it, it's obviously, this is taking place in 1924, but it's a modern story and it's, so it deals ultimately with climate change. So the conceit of the story is that the climate change we're experiencing now, which threatens humanity, is sort of part of these monsters coming back. But in a certain sense, that's revenge for the fact that human beings in control have been so racist and so violent and in their treatment of everybody else. 
So humanity will be washed away, the globe will be theirs again. The, the indifference of the cosmos to human things is juxtaposed, as I said, against actual race relations and the way in which people of color get treated in society. So he's doing a kind of inside out of Lovecraft's premise. And what Lovecraft finds horrifying, he says, well, it is horrifying, but it's not as horrifying as what everyday reality was before this happened. Okay, so we can also talk about Lovecraft in relation that the critic Donna Haraway has said, instead of the Anthropocene, maybe we should talk about the Cthulhu scene, Cthulhu being um, the monster in Lovecraft stories and Cthulhu being this sort of figure like an octopus or a squid with tentacles and um, Haraway is also reversing Lovecraft saying, well, you know, octopuses and squids are actually really interesting creatures and tentacles sort of imply entwinement, that things are entwined together, that we can't have humanity separate from the rest of the cosmos, that this horror of humanity being destroyed is partly the flip side of believing in human exceptionalism, which is usually also a racial hierarchy with the exceptional humans being white people or in Lovecraft's case, specifically Anglo-Saxons rather than everybody else. So we want to think instead about connections and things like that, instead of thinking about the monstrousness of anything which displaces white human beings from the center. Okay, and this is also taken up in a much more ambitious and longer book, The City Would Became by N.K. Jemison. And I don't know if Jemison's become one of the most well-known, best known writers of speculative fiction, rightly so in the last decade or so. Her most recent book came out earlier this year is basically about a Lovecraftian type of monster which tries to take over New York City. So it's set in, even though it's a fantasy novel, it's set in New York City in the present. And the major idea of the novel is that when cities reach a certain density, when they reach a certain intensity, when they reach a certain complexity, they kind of become alive, become conscious. And then certain human beings find themselves incarnated as the avatars of the city and of the city's human representative. And, and what we have in the book is we have an avatar of New York City, and then we have five avatars of the five boroughs, and they have to unite together to stop this kind of Cthulhu, Lovecraftian invasion and destruction of, of the city. And again, I don't have time to go through it all, but Jemison, one of the reasons her books are so fantastic is and amazing is because she has a kind of complete cosmology behind each of them. And the cosmology here is that there are multiple words, multiple forms of life. Each form of life sort of creates a new world for itself, but it's intertwined with other worlds. The living world consists in many, many different layers, which may be incompatible with each other, but sometimes they get entwined and also sometimes some layers break through. And when a city, because it's the most complicated form of both human and non-human existence, when a city becomes really vital, it breaks through the layers and and things happen, creative things happen. A city is born, all these things come together, you make connections and interchanges that never existed before. And however, this multiple, this multiplicity is threatens the kind of white supremacist society that exists before. So we have a representative of coming from Lovecraft's fiction, coming from Lovecraft's imaginary city of Riella, which is where the monsters dwell, um, who's trying to stop New York City from joining other world cosmopolitan cities in being a vibrant and multicultural place. And they have they, this, this evil force has a representative or opponent or enemy it has a representative called the woman in white, who is a white woman who makes all these sententious speeches about how these realities are threatening her reality and her supremacy over everything else. And she's objecting. I mean, she's horrified by the fact that this last quote, you eat each other's cuisines and learn new techniques, new space spice combinations, trade for new ingredients, you grow stronger. She hates multiculturalism. She hates the kind of vibrancy and, and, and growth which big cities offer, which is precisely what Lovecraft hated also. And she mentions a biological analog to this, which is the great oxidation event, which is when blue-green algae became widespread something like 2 billion years ago. They wiped out almost all the other life forms, the anaerobic life forms on the planet, but they led to a much greater diversity of life ultimately. So basically all plants, all animals, all funguses, all multi-sexual, all, multi -sexual, all multi <laughs> multicellular organisms wouldn't exist if not for these algae because they created, they became, they created the mitochondria and in our cells and the chlorophylls in animal cells in plant cells, excuse me, that made it possible for uh, 
for life to flourish. So something lost, but something much more powerful and much more various and multifarious began as a result. And Jamison is using this as an allegory or as a um, or as a metaphor for what's happening on a cultural level with the growth of cities and multiculturalism. And I'll just finally, um, what, Jamis, what Jamison's doing, she's drawing on a lot of recent thoughts, again, which are giving a new understanding both of biology and of society. So Darwinism originally was about the struggle of the competition of all against all. Social Darwinism was an attempt to apply this to human society with racial, with, in a pseudoscientific way, with racist and sexist connotations. But we now know that in life in general, as well as in human society in particular, what's much more important is cooperation, symbiosis, self-maintenance, um, creation of novelty, um, storing energy and avoiding entropy and decay. And what Jemison does, and this is kind of the neatest thing in the book, at the very end of the book is that Lovecraft sort of ha is a racist and he associated everything he hated, all the people who weren't white Anglo-Saxons with these monsters which were destroying human life. But in fact, those monsters, as Jemison points out, those monsters are actually on the side of what, what Lovecraft believed in, the kind of Anglo-Saxon um, supremacy that was the only form of civilization he'd accept. And so Jemison not only reverses the stories like of Lovecraft like Laval did, but also gives a, a kind of totally different metaphysic or totally different cosmolo cosmogony and cosmology in which um, the same biological metaphors are shown to reverse the opposite of what Lovecraft wanted. And Lovecraft's own horror and fear is itself an expression of his racism. And therefore, by going through him as a way of transcending him and getting to something much better. OK, that's basically what I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Shigeru. This work is just such a great um, pair of presentations. And we do have some time for some questions. Uh, if anybody would like to, to uh, put them in the Q&A, which you can access, uh, you should be able to access the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if, if not, I do have uh, one or two questions, but I wanted to give the, the audience. Oh, OK, let's see who um, someone has their hand up. If, if you have a question, uh, I thought I saw a hand, but um, if you have a question, please go ahead and just type it into the, um, the box. Uh, I guess I had, I had one thing, you know, in my own research on Lovecraft uh, and, and also on, on Golden Age science fiction, one interesting uh, aspect of, of both of them is, uh, both is the ideology of, re of religion and, and the extent to which uh, Lovecraft's white supremacy and his atheism were kind of uh, coterminous with, with one another. And, uh, you know, and Chris, you know, when you're talking about the, the hierarchy of civilization, this idea that um, different religions are the kind of unique expression of a, a race's character. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious if either of you would, could comment on um, either d d depictions of, of religion in, in either or Lovecraft or in, or in Golden Age sci-fi and, and the extent to which they either reinforce or, or challenge uh, racist uh, stereotypes. Um, okay, I can probably say something about that. Um, yeah, Lovecraft is in a somewhat unique position because um, he's sort of, his part of his Darwinism is he's, he's violently anti-religious, actually. And he sees religion as giving us false consolation when in fact the universe is this totally monstrous place. So there are strands in him which aren't necessarily the same way. I mean, obviously it's not easy to talk about, you know, religion in, in America or the world. Are you talking about Dr. Martin Luther King? Or are you talking about um, the, the religious right which supported Trump? I mean, they're both claimed to be Christians. So it's really hard to give a univocal stand. What Lovecraft is doing, which is interesting to me, is that he's separating the occult, what Norman's thought of as occult, he's separating it from mystical or religious type of meanings and giving it a kind of strict biological meaning. And again, this relates, I think, just to questions of how do we understand, I mean, this way, everybody has talked about this earlier, earlier today, I think, how do we understand science? There's scientific discovery is one thing, but the way science is used as a metaphor and the way it's given social power is in very many different ways. And we have, and we have often pseudoscientific, like so-called scientific ra racism, which we were just hearing about is, 
using a kind of pseudoscientific vocabulary and some dubious claim to be scientific findings in order to claim this is objective truth, this is not just my feelings, when in fact it's an ideological use. But I, you know, it's it's problematic also to just dismiss science as opposed to thinking of, I mean, the, the problem with science is who controls it, which experiments get, get made and what get funded. And um, perhaps, I mean, it would be much better to be able to combine the best of science with the best of other traditions forms of knowing, but, you know, this has nothing to do with race as a social construct in America today, obviously. Yeah, it's an interesting um, thing with the stages of civilization theory. Humanity is supposed to take some time to have religion, because through religion, you learn how to appreciate male-centered, supposedly male-centered um, uh, organization and abstract thought, and then you're supposed to pass on into the age of science. And so you can sort of um, look at some of the science fiction that depicts races as a way of saying that they have not evolved past it. Somebody like Hansen in her writing, she sort of glorifies the old religions as being the, the, the founders of a um, scientific way of thinking. And so when she looks at the old religion and the old magic, she says, oh, that was actually the origins of, of science. And, 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 and as, as we were saying, the idea of trying to decenter this um, sort of Anglo-Saxon white supremacy uh, is, is an effort, I think, sometimes seen as an effort to sort of uh, think about religion as a, as a and magic as an early form of science. Great, thanks. And uh, <clears throat> we now have a, a question from Sharon Packer. So Sharon, if you'd like to, um, to uh, ask your, your question, uh, you can, you should be able to either do so in the Q and A or. Um, oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can yes. Hear oh yeah. Um, I asked you if you had any thoughts about Lovecraft's own family background, the fact that both of his parents died in mental institutions, and if that influenced his own attitudes towards, quote unquote, inheritable degeneracy, as it was called at that time, and if he was actually projecting his background onto other people when he um, uh, articulated such extreme racist views. Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm sure it's largely true. Um, his own, I mean, Lovecraft was a very, what do we say, a maladjusted individual, which I think is a good thing rather than a bad thing. He wasn't very normative. And, but his racism is partly a compensation for that. So, I mean, if your parents died in mental institutions, then this kind of scientific race said, oh, there's a taint in your blood. Maybe it comes from not being fully white or, you know, and so he's, he's very, his extreme phobia probably has a lot to do with that. I mean, you know, it's, it's, as I said, it might be nicer if we, I, it's, the reason that this is relevant to me is because I don't think we can just dismiss white, dismiss Lovecraft, not only because of how important and influential he's been, but also because in certain ways, some of his things are genuinely imaginative. And that's, I think, why um, writers like Laval and Jemison and others have taken him on in the way they have. So, yeah. So I so yeah, it's a good question. I agree that it probably has a lot of biographical significance as well, but it also has to do with the way that people project their own personal impulses onto discourses about science and myth and religion, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And we have one, one more uh, question from Jacob. And I guess either of you could speak to this because it pertains not just to Lovecraft, but perhaps to reinterpretations of Golden Age sci-fi as well. Uh, Jacob asks, Jacob Adler asks, do postmodern reinterpretations of Lovecraft's work help to combat the prejudices he personally embodied, or is it possible that they inadvertently draw more attention to such attitudes, thus indirectly perpetuating them? Um, I, you know, this, that's, all, that's always a danger, but um, one way culture works is precisely by taking previous culture and doing stuff to it and twisting it and turning it against itself and things like that. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if Lovecraft Country, the TV show is, you know, has Lovecraft monsters, but it's also about racism in the same way that Laval's and Jemison's 
writings are. And um, yeah, I'm sure it does make some people aware of Lovecraft when they aren't. But on the other hand, it's so relevant today precisely because of the resurgent of the ultra right and you know these right wing militias and the resurgence of racism and things like that, which we've seen under under Trump in the last few years. And I also think of there's also the whole question of you know scientific athe of new atheism. So people like um, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris who are saying that they're strictly scientific and religion is evil and superstitious and but they also dubiously buy into a lot of this kind of false race science also and again it's not a question of i i would never i'm the last person to want to dismiss science but i think we have to see all how all these discourses which look for truth in their own ways work together and with and against each other and again so i mean i'm personally not religious but i you know some of that new atheist stuff made me ashamed to call myself an atheist because it was so awful and that itself is very related to the kind of atheism that Lovecraft espoused. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, the evolutionary biologist uh, Troy Duster said that the the problem with race in in America is that the the race concept was buried alive, and it's a really interesting metaphor to think of this concept that we did we hated so much that we didn't we we buried it alive without killing it <laughs> right and so and, and, you know in some ways uh I, and i think professor shaviro is, is right um and i think in some ways it's really interesting to to say maybe we need to take a look at this because this is the basis of the sort of um racism that we're seeing around us today and the the, the failure to successfully uh, kind of conquer the race concept and find a way to sort of get rid of some of these attitudes uh, has, has brought them back in a very uh, alarming way in the last four years, not just in, in politics, but also in science fiction as well, right? The, the fans who are so angry at people of color being put into their, their precious uh, science fiction franchises is, 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 is disgusting, I think, especially to those of us who really appreciate the, the spirit of inclusion that we see in science fiction. And so I think it's, you know, unfortunate maybe we don't want to perpetuate uh, any of these racist attitudes, but it is, does give us a chance to examine them and, and think about them with fresh eyes. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Shaviro and Dr. Leslie. Uh, I hope, you know, everybody has uh, um, learned a lot. I certainly have. Uh, so I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor Ellis, who will uh, kind of segue into the next part of our program. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, and you, uh, I want to you give a shout out again. Thanks, Steve, uh, for you know, sharing your work on Lovecraft with us. And Chris, I mean, you're a real trooper. Just so everybody knows, Chris is half a world away in China right now, so it's very late for him. Go get some rest, man. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to get some sleep. <laughs> all right, thank, but thanks again. Uh, and we'll see you next time you're in New York, okay? Um, so we'll get things set up now for the next roundtable, which is going to be the Science Fiction Writers Roundtable. Uh, this was organized by Emily Hockaday, and it'll be moderated by Joy Sanchez Taylor. And we got Alea Don Johnson, uh, Cadwell Turnbull, Aaron Roberts, and Carlos Hernandez coming up in just a minute. So let me get things set up and uh, we'll get that underway in just a moment. So if you need to take a break, go uh, do that right now real quick and then we'll get started again.